Hello and welcome everybody to the third lecture of on data analysis in the lecture ICT for smart grids. Uh, my name is still Vincent Latsko. I'm still at the same uh, office and you can still reach me via email. I know this works because some of you have already emailed me, so that's wonderful. Today we will look at uh, machine learning models and in particular we will have a in-depth look into deep learning. Um, just as a short reminder in the very first lecture I believe uh, uh, Dr. Abdel Kadar said that we would look at Bayesian methods. Uh, we will not because we cannot do this justice. Um, it's just too short of a time frame. Um, so we will look more into what all machine learning models have in common and look at the most common one which is neural nets. But first we will start with a short recap of the last lecture, or read the last lectures, plural. Um, then we will look into mathematical formulation and what training means in terms of neural networks. This makes heavy use of the backpropagation algorithm, which we will look at. And of course again we look at gradient descent, because you can never have enough of that, because all of the machine learning optimization problems rely on gradient descent. We will shortly talk about how to avoid overfitting in neural nets and look at loss functions. And we will finish with a short introduction to convolutional neural networks. In the next session, we will have a hands-on uh, on deep learning and we will also have a clarification of any and all uncertainties or well uh, problems that you encountered with my explanations of this topic. So please send me emails telling me what I should look at uh, again to and use different words to explain to you again because well there will be a test all right so last time we looked at supervised learning and it really works very very much the same way as last time <laughs> so you have a data set you have which means they have pairs of input and output and you have potentially a lot of pairs, you feed them to, to an algorithm and this algorithm gives you an output. So, okay, fair enough. We looked at two examples for, for classification, this one for classification and one for regression problems. We will also have a look uh, at, these, at two of these examples in the hands-on. And I gave you for to really drive the intuition home. Um, again, I gave, tr showed you one example um, that really drives home. You have inputs, you have an unknown process that you cannot model, but you have a learning algorithm that approaches it and you get outputs. So on the right hand side, you see these handwritten threes and the learning algorithm figures out they are threes. So this is really, um, you see that this learning algorithm in this example specifically, that this learning algorithm is a sum mapping from input to an output space. In this case, the input space is very high dimensional. So this, these are pictures that are 28 by 28 pic uh, pixels. Um, so these are a lot of parameters, so to speak. And on the right hand side, uh, every single sample just has uh, a one dimensional uh, output, which is only, I mean, it's okay, maybe it's a 10 dimensional output, but, but still it's, it's very small in comparison. So we had this loop of you feed data to a model, um, you optimize because you measure the error that the model uh, makes in its predictions via the um, ground truth or the label that you use. Uh, and then you, the, from these errors you generate gradients or um, some way of changing the internal parameters of the model and then you update the model parameters and you iterate. So you solve this optimization problem in an iterative manner. All right, this is in text form, what I just said. Um, so I'm not going to repeat this. And um, we also touched at this briefly last time. Basically model order selection, uh, model selection, not model order selection, that's something part of model selection. But um, So understanding you have training data, you have validation data and you have test data two of which are given here. So you use training data to train the model to find the parameters that best fit the data set, that, uh, that best fit the data set in the training part. And then you validate this with a validation set in order to keep the model from just learning the test data by heart. And then again, you compare uh, the different 
models that you produce by feeding um, by feeding a training data to different models. So sometimes you have a model um, that has a higher expressive power and sometimes you have a, a lower dimensional model. And for each model, so here we're not, so we're training the model, but we're also not training just one model, but we train a lot of models and then we select the best one. Uh, this is the, the key part, but we, we covered this all, all this in the last lecture already. And in the end, of course, after we argue that the model has converged, we're happy with the results. This, then we have the model f hat star and this is the the optimal model for our data and then we use this model to train uh, to test on the test set and um, report the performance so with this being said we now go into the deep learning th theory deep learning because this is the hype right now because what we talked about last time linear regression logistic regression can be thought of as special cases of deep learning and um, it's also a very beginner friendly mechanism for for um, for getting into this right the slides here are partly from dr bonetto who left the chair just a few months ago um, but most of the slides i created when i uh, held a lecture for him when he was back in italy <laughs> so this is something that we have had last time already, the framework um, of notations. So we have the data set X with, with the samples XI. These are vectors um, and the desired labels. So the desired output that we want to get from the model. Um, YIs and the YI hats, which are the predictions of our model. Um, just as this is on the next, next line, then we have this model F, which is fed an uh, input XI. And it has parameters theta, um, that, which are tunable. And this makes predictions. And of course, we have this error measure. We will have a look at that very shortly. Um, but what is this, this model? Now, so we've seen models can be easy and can be more involved. Now let's have a look at something that is both easy and more involved. This is a neural network. Because every one of those units, the green circles, uh, is inspired by a neural, uh, by a neuron. Um, it's really just loosely inspired, and there's a ton of literature. You can just Google something. Um, the neural networks that you see in machine learning are nothing like the neur neural networks that you have inside your head. So they are not like a brain, not at all. Anyone who tells you didn't get it. So don't don't let anyone tell you that the brain is similar to uh, what is in in the machine. But anyway, um, you have an input X, just like in any machine learning output. You have a prediction Y hat, like in any machine learning um, method. And what's what's different now is that you have these units, and they are all the same. So what whatever these units do, it's just the same. Um, there is a small caveat. Of course, there are some variances, so you can um, use different things. But in general, they are all very similar. And the idea is to flow from the input towards the prediction through multiple layers. Now these things are arranged in layers and they only feed in one direction. So they only go from the left to the right. Again, there are different um, architectures that feed back the output from one unit to another in the, in the previous layer, for example. But since this is only an introductory course, uh, we cannot cover this. In any way, what these what these units do, um, we will have a look at here. So, the units themselves they are not very intelligent. Um, what is what makes the system intelligent is the combinations of mon of many of them and the structure. So a lot of the a lot of the expressivity is encoded in the structure of the network, not so much in the individual components of the network. And um, all these connections between the units, they are um, called uh, the, well, the connections, they are associated with weights. And these weights, so this W1 is a scalar, it's a number. W2 and W3, of course, are also a scalar. And every edge of the, uh, there has a, has a scalar value associated with it. Um, and it gets some input. So this X1 here uh, is weighted by this weight W1 
and as is the x2 by w2, as is x3 by w3. And if you don't know any better, then you just sum everything up. So you, you, what happens inside the neuron now, inside this uh, green circle is, you take the weighted input, so w1 times x1, uh, and sum it with over all the inputs. And once you've done this, you, you end up with one scalar value, and you put this one scalar value in some function th uh, sigma. This sigma is a nonlinear function, typically. Uh, nonlinear because if sigma were a linear function, and like in this example, you put one after the other of these units, then you chain linear functions. And chaining linear functions is not very exciting because linear functions chained after one another yields a linear function. <laughs> So you, you don't gain a whole lot of things. However, if the sigma is nonlinear, then this becomes a, a, a very big nonlinear function because a nonlinear function after a nonlinear function is still a nonlinear function. And actually it is more expressive than, than on its own. All right, so that is nice. How do we work with it? Unfortunately, before we can work with it, we have to introduce a lot of notation. Um, this is a little bit hard, bear with me. This will get easier after I told you how to derive this on the spot in your head. So we will start with the hardest of them all, this W, the weight itself. So this WJK in L, and if you call it like this, it's actually quite easy. So I call it in L because this is the weight in the layer L. And it's associates the connection from unit k to unit j. So basically this is like a vector. It points from the, uh, to, the, to the destination j from the origin k and since the origin k is in layer L minus 1 because we only we only go from one layer to the next, we don't skip layers, we don't return uh, to previous layers, Above that k, there could be an l minus one, but since it's this is the only thing that can stand there, it's it's just dropped for simplicity and for hmm, let's say it ease of notation. <laughs> so this w j k in l, this is just the weight of the connection. There's also a bias uh, b j in l. Uh, this is the bias for the jth unit because what I didn't tell you before in the slide before. Before you sum everything, so after you sum everything, before you put it into the nonlinearity, there's a small threshold. So if all the activations that you get, so if, if everything that you sum up by the way uh, by the weighted income uh, inputs, if it doesn't hit a certain level, you just neglect it. Nothing happens. And this is this bj. So um, this bj is just another parameter, a single scalar for every single unit for every neuron. Uh, inst so this is this is a, just a very just one number very easy. Um, this is added before you uh, enter the nonlinearity. So and after the nonlinearity for notation, you just call this whole thing the activation a j in L. All right. Next thing that we need is the vectorization, um, which is kind of a broadcast operation. So if you have a function f or a mapping f from r to r, from, so from the space of real numbers to the space of real numbers, basically um, this x goes to f of x. The vectorized version of it is just defined as acting on the individual elements of this vector x uh, in, in rn. So you call this function n times for this n-dimensional vector. Okay, that, that's actually not so hard. Um, for simplicity, sometimes we, we end up introducing this Z in L on the lower lower uh, part of the slide, which is just the argument to the nonlinearity. Uh, so this is just nothing to be uh, uh, excited about. It's just for, for shortening this A in L equals sigma of Z in L. Nothing more. Okay. That was quite a mouthful. Um, let's go to something easier. <laughs> Once our model um, is set up and does something, we need to measure its performance somehow. And um, so here, on, once you set it up, the input goes in, the output comes out, 
how good is the output? How does anyone know? Um, enter, uh, enter the loss functions. <laughs> loss functions are um, typically very, very, very problem dependent. And traditionally what people have come up with is for regression problems, they use the mean square error. For classification, they use cross entropy. These two loss functions we will introduce very shortly uh, on the next slides in detail, but this is, it's critical to understand. This is just um, a rough guideline. If you have any sort of machine learning problem, you may end up writing your own loss function because this is so very problem dependent. In my diploma thesis, I had the, the, fa uh, the situation that where I developed my own loss function and actually parameterized it, uh, estimating the hyperparameter based on the data. <laughs> um, because this is, I just ha had a non-typical problem. Uh, so the, reg the reason why they use mean square error for regression is because they assume that, or you typically assume that the, the error is Gaussian distributed. And if you have Gaussian, so normal distributed errors, then the mean square error is the, um, the natural um, uh, metric, so to speak. But anyway, um, the mean square error, it looks like this. You just take the difference from the model's output to the, uh, to the true value, to the label. You take the absolute value or the, no the two norm, just square it, so the two norm, and then you sum everything up and divide by the number of samples, um, and then you get the, the cost. Some, sometimes it's cost, sometimes it's loss. Um, it's really just it, it's just a question of personal preference. Apologies if I s switch between the two. It's just very it's something that you don't pay attention anymore. In any way, what happens is that the model. Um, so this this cost function is a measure for the similarity uh, of the model's output to the desired output. These cost functions are always po are positive, and they typically go to zero when that when the model output is approaching your desired output. Okay, the second uh, one is the cross entropy. Um, cross entropy, again, is used for classification sometimes, and then you have, uh, there you can have this one minus yi in the, uh, as a product before the, log the natural logarithm, um, because this tends to be, uh, if you have classification, you typically have zero or one, so an object either belongs to a class or it does not. Um, and then there's only one part contributing, right? All right. Um, however, if you have these cost functions on single elements or single samples, you can, of course, um, write it down or even calculate it, no problem. But what you actually uh, have to do, of course, is you have to do it on a whole, on a set of samples, on a, on a data set. And the assumption is always that um, if you average, over a subset of samples, then you approach some, um, so the whole thing converges to some loss or cost C. Um, and of course, <laughs> you, you always have to assume, so to speak, or you are, actually you constructed the cost in the, in the way that the cost is a function of the output of the neural network. Okay, so what is this? What is this F? What is this theta? I don't know, maybe I also asked this before, but in essence, um, it's, it's obvious that this f is the model and this theta are the parameters of the model which we have to tune such that the model performs better. But I want you to consider what for minimization of this distance between the model's output and the label, what a nice property would be. Mm. And if you know this already, or if you got the answer, being so, for example, I don't know, maybe you want a convex loss function. How would you train the model? So, fuck you. So, what is this f? What is this theta? Um, this f, as we introduced it before, it's the, it's the model and theta are the parameters of the model that we have to tune in order to increase the model's performance on the task. Um, but the next question is, what would be a nice property of our whole setup for optimization? 
not just of f, not just of theta, uh, but also of the whole f whole loop, for example, uh, of the cost. And of course, it would be very good if it was a convex loss function because if it is, then we know that there is a minimum, so that would be good. But even if it is, how do we train the model? So training basically means we need to minimize the error with respect to the desired output, um, just making the model perform better, so to speak. Now the issue is that um, we have to efficiently compute this gradient. Gradient meaning we have to find out in which direction do we have to wiggle our, our tiny wheels in our big function such that the model performance in general uh, increases. Um, the solution for this is the backpropagation algorithm. Now the question is <laughs> why? <laughs> why is the solution backprop? Where backprop is short for backpropagation. Now the thing is and deep learning methods tend to have many more parameters than traditional methods. Um, sometimes they go into the millions, sometimes into the billions, and I kid you not, billions of parameters, that's that's really a thing. And for optimization we typically cannot do this in one or two steps. In fact, thousands of minimization steps are typically required. This is not a this is not a an overestimation. And in fact you may want to train not just one model or two models, but rather a zoo of models, because you want to find out can I get away with a smaller model? So some some model that is less uh, computationally intense because you have small hardware to run it on. But in the end, even for one model, you have millions of parameters, you have thousands of minimization steps. So this product of millions times thousands of billions is it's in computationally infeasible. You don't want to to be in a way, uh, in a situation where you have to run this. However, if you have thousands of minimization steps that you have to run, and you run it twice, so thousands times two, that is deemed acceptable. How does this work, the switchcraft? <laughs> um, basically, the propagation, the backpropagation works in the way where you have um, the output of the network, so you express the error in the layer L, capital L here being the last layer of the network, with respect to the activation. Um, then you express the error in some layer L, which is not the last layer, and um, all the while you find an expression for the gradient of the cost function with respect to the bias and the weights, so the parameters of the model. And then you're done. So let's do this. Um, let's start with the last layer. So this delta J in capital L is the error in the last layer. And the error in the last layer is just the cost um, given um, uh, with respect to the, the label, the output. So the derivative um, with respect to the, uh, to the parameters is just dz over dz J in L. So basically we can reformulate this and multiply here with a suitable one. So this um, a k in L. Um, and then we just figure out, okay, actually, let's have a look at this. <laughs> um, this d a k in L over d z j in L, you see this on this small error, right? Um, the, the part being that the activation is just the output of the nonlinearity. And if I derive then the, the, this output with respect to the uh, the z, which is the argument of the nonlinearity, then we find out that oh wait a second, actually this is zero for all the times where we're not looking at the same neuron. So the the different neurons k in the in in, in the layer capital L, they only contribute to the loss if this is the same neuron. Of course we can do this in a vectorized manner because we have to do it for every neuron in the layer capital L anyway. Um, and then we figure out, okay, this is the gradient then. And we find that this is the first equation of backprop already. So this, this nabla here is of course the, 
Uh, so this inverted delta, so <laughs> this triangle, it's a NABLA operator. It's just a vectorized deri derivative, right? The first derivative. Uh, this, I believe this, this should be known. Now let's move on. We have to go to a, to a generic layer, so to any layer L. Um, so let's go there. <laughs> um, in fact, what we're doing is basically we associate, you see this here in the, um, in the central equation. So we have this date delta J in L, lowercase l. And this is of course a sum because we have to go through all of the uh, layers up until that point from the back. Um, this is the derivative of the cost with respect to the activation in the layer L plus one. Um, times the derivative, the partial derivative of this, um, the weighted activations in, in layer L plus one, derived by this delta uh, Z J in L. Now, um, we just derived what this delta K in L plus one is. So what, uh, what this thing is, we just derived it for this layer capital L. So this L plus one here, if we put a capital L here, then we already know what this is. Now we, we only have to deal with the, the tiny bit on the, on the right. So this dzk in L plus one over dzj in L. And we will do this in the next slide. Um, so this whole thing turns out it's, it's just not a lot. <laughs> because if you write it out, so this z is just uh, w times a plus b, right, for, for now with all the indices, this becomes a little bit more involved, but this z is just a w times a plus b, right, this was on the on the slide in the, in the beginning, where we have just we sum all the inputs after weighting them by the parameters w, wi, and then we subtract, or we add this threshold b, and, and that's it, so that was this z. So let's go to the to the next uh, part, because this a i in l is nothing else but the um, the activation, which is the output of the nonlinearity. So we can we can deal with this, because if we now derive it, so now you derive the left hand side of the whole equation. So this part we derive it with respect to delta uh, d j dzj in L. So by this, we, we do the, we form this partial derivative. Um, this bk in L plus one is constant with respect to z, so it goes away by in the derivation. Um, but this sum here is of course not a constant because there is actually a zi in L that's varying, because at some point this running index i will achieve will be j as well, equal to j and in that case um, this is non negative okay so we it turns out we find this delta j in l as simply this this exact part here so we have this delta k in l plus 1 times w k comma j in l plus 1 times sigma prime of z j in l and sigma prime becomes because of the uh, product rule because if we if we do this derivation, we have to uh, to add this, of course. All right, and if we um, vectorize this, so we again apply a broadcast operator because we need to do this for every single neuron, not just for the unit J, which we've done it for. Uh, we need to do this for everyone. So after vectorizing, we find the second equation of backprop. I promise you, this was a hard part. This is it. The rest is. It's, easy. it's very easy. So, but now it's uh, actually the, the most important part because now we're finding the derivative with respect to the model parameters. So now we have this dz by dbj in L, um, and this is just nothing but again summing all up, multiplying with a, a suitable one, and then we it turns out that um, this dz k in L over dbj in L it uh, goes to zero because uh, z varies with b uh, just in a constant way so it does not and um, there's just a one and the one is just a one <laughs> so it goes away in the in the, in this upsilon in this uh, in this derivative 
So we, we end up with this delta J in L. Again, vectorize it, third equation of back prop. And now this was really surprising when I first saw it because what you consider to be the hardest part of it all is actually just one line. So this is the derivative or the gradient of the cost function with respect to the model parameters with to the weights. And this is just nothing else but the multiplication of the activations with the, the L, with the, this delta J in L. However, uh, the genius of the whole backprop is that we associate the weights, uh, th this error, with uh, the layer before. So what we have to do is we run from the right where the capital L is, so the large L, we run to the left and we associate every error that we form with the activations of the error before, which again is dependent of the activations uh, in the error be uh, in the layer before. So we're always moving towards the input. That's why it's called the back propagation. We can also do this in graph form. Um, and this is a very simple neural network, uh, right? This is only one dimensional. And here we, we, we really move from the input to the output once. Uh, then we form the, the cost. So this, um, in this case, on the right hand side, on the graph on the right, you see the only the last layer. So we have the C0. The C0 is, is, is built in, in the way that we subtract Y0 from A in L, in capital L, uh, according to our measure. This may be mean squared error, for example, right? Um, and then we have the C0. The C0 we want to derive with respect to W in 2. So the second layer, this W2, um, in this case, it's lowercase u. Okay, anyway, um, so this w2 is this w2. Sorry for having the index lowercase in here and uppercase here. That's a little bit unfortunate, sorry. And then we again multiply with a suitable one. So here this, and this is again a one here and a one here. Um, and we, we end up with just finding something very similar. But of course, you can, and of course, you can do the same with the bias. Um, B2 in this case, um, but and it's actually even easier. But this is something that I leave for you to do if you're interested. The question, of course, is why uh, and what did we really gain? And what we gained is um, we basically associated the the error on the from the out with something on the left of it. So we propagate towards the the input. And of course, what you're what you're seeing here is that the C zero over D A two is just the derivative, the partial derivative of the cost uh, of these two arguments. So the first argument is the Y zero, the label, and the A two is just the the output of the last nonlinearity. So this this is trivial. Uh, this is very easy. I mean, this is something that you can compute right away. Um, the second part, D A two over D Z two. It's just a partial derivative of the nonlinearity at this uh, point z2. So at the with these um, numbers z2, for example, so let's say, and of course dz over dw is just uh, so knowing the act. This z is just w times a plus b. Then of course you also understand what this partial derivative here is. So you move from the right to the left, and of course you need to average this overall element of the data set because otherwise you're just doing it for one sample. All right, um, putting this into an algorithm, um, it's it's a little bit messed up. It's, it's, uh, I will I will fix this in the in the in the final slides. So in the forward pass, you just store all the parameters, you compute all the errors, uh, and then you do the backward pass where you compute um, where you report all this. Um, um, all these deltas, and you get the gradients. At, at the same time during the back prop and then um, you get the gradients and know in which direction you have to um, tune the, the weights, move the weights so to speak. Now what? We can now um, of course do gradient descent because we now have the gradient um, and this is something that you've seen before I guess I, I think 
we covered this in the last lecture already. So we want to move this x star because x star is the, the minimum and we never want to be in, the, in an, a different spot. We always want to be in minima because minima are beautiful. It's uh, the right place to be. So if we start in this place x1 uh, on the x-axis here, and this is our, let's say, error measure f, um, we want to go down here. How do we go down in a systematic way? Well, we form the tangent and then decide if the tangent is zero. In this case, it clearly is not because if it's, and if it's zero, we're in an optimum because for convex uh, uh, situations, if uh, there's no cellar points. Um, but in this case, it's clearly not zero, the tangent. So the gradient, so the one dimensional gradient is the tangent, right? Um, but it, the useful information is it gives us a, a sign. So the gradient here has a sign. In this case, it's uh, it's negative. So we know in which direction to go. If it's negative, we go to the right. If it's positive, we go to the left. Uh, and then we move in that direction. Now, the question is, of course, how far to move. Um, and the easy answer is as long as the sign doesn't change. So we would move from, from this point, go all the way, all the way, all the way here. And then the sign changes, so we stop. This would be easy. However, it takes a lot of steps. Um, so what you end up with is you do bigger steps. The step size is called lambda, and it's also called the learning rate. Um, turns out if, if lambda is very big, so you, you, you may end up jumping far, and then you jump far back, and so on and so forth. So typically you, you change this somehow during training, you reduce it, but you don't want to do day teeny tiny baby steps all the time. And in fact, it um, turns out that you can find optimal parameters this way. Beautiful. Um, now, implementing this, it's not, not very easy, but it's not very hard either. You just typically have the choice of taking the whole data set um, and hoping that you finish before you die uh, in the time of big data. Um, but this is already, um, I already answered the question, what's the negative part of this? Um, so if you use all the data set, uh, you have the problem that it takes a long time for because you have to compute the gradient for all of the data set. And if the data set is very big, then um, it may not be feasible. Um, but then at least you know in which direction to go and you know it exactly, huh? because then uh, you know that you go into exactly the right direction because, of course, you looked at every single sample that you have. Now, the since we're impatient creatures, uh, we typically don't do this. We just use a single sample and hope that the loss of the sample x, so the cost of the sample x, is approximately the cost uh, of the whole data set. And we do a single, single step. The pro of that is it is very easy because we just do a single sample. Single samples are easy to, to compute, otherwise we're, f we're in a bad spot anyway. Um, but single samples, of course, uh, it's also not very accurate because it cannot be. If a single sample, so if this were true, then uh, we wouldn't need the data set anymore because then we, we, would, can, we can do everything with one sample. So uh, we, have to, we have to balance these two. There is a third uh, way, which is the stochastic gradient descent. Um, and this works, we don't use all of the data set, we don't use one sample. So we do something in the middle, we just select a subset, we do it in a random manner, we compute the cost of this subset, perform a descent, a gradient descent step, and we repeat until we've used all of the data set in this way. This is um, called the minimum batch gradient descent, and it's basically the, the de facto standard um, because it's just so efficient. And you typically take subsets in the size, so of course as big as possible, um, but you're limited basically by, by memory. Um, so sometimes it's GPU memory, sometimes it's uh, main memory, however uh, in recent times maybe not, but um, so this is, this is just the, the de facto standard way. Okay, of course, um, machine learning is not the solution for everything. Um, <laughs> you're trying, so this is really important, right? So if you have this beautiful model and it works wonderfully on your training set, it works wonderfully on your validation set, it actually works even on the, on the uh, test set. 
it may not work in the real world because what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out a mapping from um, some input to some output and this is by the very nature it's very limited and so typically your model is either too simple or too complex if it's too simple it doesn't perform well if it's too complex it doesn't perform well uh, but of other reasons um, and um, one of these reasons is uh, is the overfitting uh, let's talk about underfitting though first if the model is too simple so it has too little parameters um, it won't be able to capture the the data that you have so for example um, if you know that um, your your data set is, is quite diverse and quite big you can't expect a small model to to understand everything so if you think back to the example with the classification of cars bicycles and motorcycles um, you, let's say you have these three classes if your model only has three parameters it's very unreasonable to expect that it can learn anything or that it makes any predictions that are better than random actually it may be better than random if your data set is not is not evenly distributed <laughs> but this is this is one of the pitfalls that you may have there so in essence a small model cannot learn cannot necessarily learn everything that it, that you want it to learn so the solution is to make the model bigger and um, give it more parameters give it more storage so to speak and um, more capabilities but you're now on the slippery slope of giving it so many parameters that it just learns the whole data set by heart and becomes a database um, and then it, at that moment it will not be able to cope with new samples that you um, that you feed it in in production for example so um, there is this this is called overfitting and there have been quite some um, approaches of fighting overfitting uh, basically two two options have Develop them. One is regularization, and um, the other is dropout. Um, dropout is specific to neural networks, so we will talk about it. But very briefly, regularization is um, changing the the function, the, the cost function, and you do this in a way that you add a penalty term. So there is a, a an extra sum. Uh, so here with we have the the classical cost function c, and now we add something to it. In this case, we add, for example, squared uh, weights, um, and this is the two norm. This basically forces the weights w uh, um, to be small, right? So uh, because s squaring them makes uh, big numbers big and small numbers very small. So um, if you minimize the loss, then you force the weights to be small, which can be beneficial in some applications. There's also the one norm where you just um, use the uh, don't don't square the weights. <laughs> uh, this forces them the weights to be sparse because this is an isometry to the w uh, to the zero norm, which is really the sparsity inducing norm. But uh, this this goes a little bit far. There are different regularization approaches, and this is a science in itself. We can't cover it here. Just be aware that this exists. The much more widespread um, option in terms of neural networks is actually the dropout which works in the way that um, during training, some of these edges between the, the nodes, uh, or between layers are dropped. They are just just deleted, so to speak, for, uh, for in the training process, which means that um, the network now is forced to perform without relying on single connections. And this, you can, you can imagine that this um, basically destroys any uh, approach for the model becoming a database because it cannot rely on element on, on single elements so this is a really useful um, strategy against that and it turns out that dropout dominates regularization because it fits so nicely into this framework of deep learning because it turns out that this dropout can be implemented as a layer and then it fits naturally into the, the framework and it's also very powerful at regularizing the loss oops we have this already so let's go to a very 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 short intro of convolutional neural networks because they have um, so widespread um, uses and also because they are very beautiful in the sense that um, you can explain really well what's what's happening with them so 
CNNs are, or confnets, they are really made for uh, images. And images are just multi-dimensional tensors, so to speak. This is just a, um, the machine learning talk for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, a tensor, just very quickly, tensors have order, uh, like a vector has size, for example. Uh, a tensor has an order. Uh, a tensor of order 0 is just a scalar. A tensor of order 1 is a vector. A tensor of order 2 is a matrix. And a tensor of order 3 is a tensor or hypermatrix or something like this. In any way, it's just a multidimensional matrix, so to speak. Um, and if you have the three dimensions for the input, which are height and width of an image, plus the depth, um, which would be the color channel, um, then that image is right. Um, and the idea is that images are very correlated. So a pixel is not alone. It is surrounded by other pixels. And there are spatial correlations between the pixels. So in, in most cases, if you look around the world, you see things Glue, being glued together by by reality so uh, two if two things are very different in color on an image they are typically belong to to some interesting um, part of the image be it a border between two objects or uh, some elements um, that are somehow exciting and uh, this is this is exploited in CNNs um, and it is so um, because you can use neural networks as feature extractors it, it turns out that if you connect everything in these uh, neural networks to everything, so this is called a dense, um, this is computationally really, really demanding because if you have n neurons in L layers, of course, you have n times n, this is the connection between uh, two layers, uh, you have already n squared, uh, and then you have this L times, so this is to the power of L, so really, really bad. Now, convolutions are the solution for this, uh, at least one solution. And what we're doing is we're convolving an, the input with a kernel. These kernels have compact support, so they are zero almost everywhere. Um, and they only act on limited part of the input data, the image in this case. And uh, the kernels are learned typically, so you can backprop through the kernel which is really, really nifty because now you adapt to the problem domain. Um, and in fact, the kernels, they learn representation of the data. Um, so after this convolutional kernel, there is a nonlinearity, of course. Uh, and you can also add different things. And it turns out that uh, people spend lots of time optimizing the, the architecture of these networks. So you can uh, add something like a dropout. You can um, add something like a skip connection, which we have not talked about, but in essence, it lets you skip one layer. Um, it's really nifty because it allows deep networks. So oh, there's a, it's a beautiful paper by He. Um, he's from Microsoft. I can very much recommend this reading this paper. And you can also do some normalization where you just normalize these layers. These are optimizations um, that people have come up with uh, in the in the ImageNet challenge. So the the key part to understand is that there is not just one kernel. Uh, in CNNs, you have many kernels. And say you have k kernels, then each kernel is convolved. So it's just like in one dimensional convolution, you can also convolve in two dimensions. And there was actually an animation here. I don't know where it is. It's not It's not working. Thank you. Ah, oh, there is something. OK. Now it comes. Sorry for keeping you. <laughs> so uh, this this. Uh, gray shade on the low on the blue input this is the kernel right and this kernel moves it's convolved with the blue image the blue input and by this convolution there uh, become there is a the shadow of this and on the green uh, output space this is just the 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 output of this convolution process i don't want to say the product because it's not a product <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, what's happening is this kernel is, uh, is sliding over the input and generates a new output map. Um, and this is one kernel. There may be more kernels. So there typically are a lot of kernels and these produce a lot of outputs. These outputs are just stacked one another and one after the other and then 
um, of course your dimensionality explodes um, because for k kernels you have k uh, responses you have k feature maps and this is just for one layer so this uh, becomes a, a tough problem somehow and in order to reduce the amount of parameters is what what you're doing is um, there is pooling and pooling is something there are many kinds of pooling there's uh, for example max pooling or average pooling or global pooling these are just names um, and uh, there is um, something that we have here so uh, again the convolution you see on the top just ignore this because we've just seen this um, the pooling is on the on the right hand lower right hand side so you have this this red block here of 1156 and max pooling uh, with this 2 by 2 um, area of looking at things would just take from this red part the largest value in this case a 6 and of course from the green part it takes the 8 and from the yellow part it takes a 3 and from the blue part it takes the 4 and you end up with a, a much reduced output so you what happens is you're f trying to find interesting features uh, and then so and you find these interesting features using the kernels and then what's happening in pooling is you reduce the immense um, feature maps that you created by the many kernels that you used uh, and because this is too much data and most of it is actually not very uh, very interesting so one kernel may only look at uh, look for something like an edge and only finds edges and there are not typically a lot of edges in, in an input space uh, so this is zero nearly everywhere and so it was very wasteful to encode all this information so you just sort of compress it down and you just look at where is this edge in this case it would be looking for where is this largest occurrence of the kernel so this is um, this is just I mean neural networks and specifically the convolutional neural networks have revolutionized uh, image recognition in, in the recent years actually this is it's been going on for quite some time now um, this is um, very interesting we will have a look at this in the deep learning um, hands-on that we're going to have next week as i said before uh, write me your questions so that i can uh, have a chance of addressing your questions so that you can um, get a good grasp of what this machine learning can do for you um, and so that you can have the chance of writing a good exam